if any listeners know what's inside a lava I'm not willing to Google what's inside a lava lamp. It, it's wax. Somebody- Oh, it's wax. Okay, it's you wax. could clean that up. So there, there's wet, but then there's like the the liquid substance. The, the, like, the what water. Is that? It's just water. Oh, okay, that's easy to clean up. Well, maybe not once it's it pink. Hardens. Oh, <laughs> it's like it's very pink. That's um, not gonna clean I, up. But I feel like the the wax is probably like because it's not on. I, I feel like I was. We were talking about how my books all fell and they nearly missed the lava lamp. Um, and that would have been a dark day. Um, for many reasons, if that lava lamp would have broken <laughs> and spilled all over, so it makes me think of was that book one where she tries to spray something pink and that just oh yep. yeah yeah <laughs> we can banter our way into this. There you go. Well done. Nice segue. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome <laughs> to romance. <laughs> romance to TBR. TBR. If you heard a third voice. That's because we have a very exciting special guest today. We do. Um, Elizabeth, do you, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hello. Yes. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Everett. I write Victorian rom-coms. And my uh, series, The Secret Scientists of London, is about um, women scientists who find love and the final um, of the trilogy has just come out <clears throat> a love by design, which features a woman engineer. And next up, I'm doing a spin off series, The Damsels so of Discovery, oh. that starts off with a woman apothecary who provides reproductive health care. So here we go. Oh. Buckle up. I'm so excited. I, you mentioned that to me a while ago, and I had just read Joanna Shoup's, um The Duke Gets Even. Um, and that was also like pretty timely. And I was like, I'm so ready, ready for this. But yeah, I'm very excited for that series. And I was like sad to see this ending, but then you're like, it's like a, there's still in the same world. So they're still in the same world. So you'll see, yeah, yeah. You'll see some of these characters again and again. Um, I do love that. Mm -hmm. I can say if, if, um, the, the teaser chapter, you you know that um, for uh, the next series, you know that Winthrum is back. So Winthrum is back. Yay! He is a he is a private agent now. Ooh. Has moved on from his dorman duties. So yeah, so lots of characters come in and out, and so for those, so and they're all standalones. Those you can read it and enjoy it. But for those of you who've read the first series, you you get little Easter eggs. You're like. Oh, good. I love that. Oh, I love me Winthrum. in every book in this series. Like every sub- subsequent book, I'm like, oh, I know you. Yes, I love you. That was my. I read all three of them this month, just recently, and my probably my favorite was the third. Although I I love all of them, but I was living for Arthur and Violet in the third mm-hmm. book. I love Arthur so much. <laughs> he was kill- and like I think that you write uh, like male friendships. You're like one of my favorite writers of male friend because I have two pretty much like much older brothers and I was like this feels right <laughs> they would just bullied each other the entire time instead of talking about feelings and I was like yeah you got that you nailed it <laughs> That's... Uh, yeah they don't change much as they age no <laughs> boys no so and just Elizabeth just like use narration for Arthur that's true Yes. Yeah. She's great. I really, really like her. I'm so happy that Berkeley, she actually, I found her because I was listening to um, different like snippets of narrations of different Berkeley books. And she Mm -hmm. did the narration for Evie Dunmore's books. Bringing down the Duke. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. She was, I heard that and I thought, oh, like I'm listening to a man, even though I'm listening to a woman Mm -hmm. narrate it. And I, I wanted her. And she said yes. So I've been very lucky. She's done all three. I love her her accents and like all the different um, characters. But Arthur is my favorite. So Okay. I'll tell her. <laughs> so good. It's, uh, you can't go wrong with a Scott. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> I've heard some people do a Scottish accent and they're going pretty wrong. So oh, I can go well, wrong. I mean, you can't go wrong with like, a Scottish character, a yeah. good narrator. Yeah. Ooh, I'll yeah. lead it up every time. You're right. <laughs> some people can. My favorite is obviously you You have like the height difference um, in the book two, but my favorite height difference is Grantham. <laughs> 
and Arthur. <laughs> and Arthur. It's like this much. It's like literally <laughs> like it's a hair's breadth. And Grantham is like, I tower over you. It's like you're such a small man. <laughs> And you know how you have that one that one thing, you know, like like people used to make fun of Trump because he had teeny tiny little hands, yeah. big, you know, and it doesn't like, if, and it's ridiculous. And of course, he can fit his hands around a coffee mug, but the joke is that he can't. And it just gets like guys get like that. They they riff and they get funnier and they get funnier. And I just laugh to myself while every time I'm like, "Ha! Huh, how would Grantham point out that he's taller than Arthur at this point?" Yeah, it's just gonna get worse. Yeah. My, I have this running bit with one of my brothers that's been going on for years because I accidentally lightly punched him in the face once. (laughs) Like we were slow motion, like joking, fighting, and he turned his head when I moved my hand and it like grazed. It wasn't, I was like 12 or something. It did not damage him, but he still brings it up and will be like, hey, remember when you punched me in the face and put me in a in a coma for like 60 years and it gets like lo- the coma gets longer every time the bit comes up and so that is what I thought every time Grantham would be like oh this tiny little man I was like why does it keep getting because of course it does I love Grantham god and then in in book two you have like um or maybe it's book one I just I read them all for like the third well I read two books maybe for the third time and then the third book for the second time um there's like the um bridget jones diary uh colin firth and hugh grant fight scene like the two yes. is it is it grantham and arthur or is it grantham and arthur yeah, yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. that and was also this very really fun that relationship <laughs> and i laughed i was i could just see it in my hand i thought oh god can i i just hope i got that on the page it was so fun the way it happened in my head because the t- yeah that um i i love the romances but i also like introducing male characters into these into women's worlds mm-hmm. because i love writing about women obviously um i love writing about strong women but i love even more to introduce men who aren't afraid of that strength into their world and and watch them react and see what happens and um, Arthur and Grantham are so – those two men are so important to Violet. They had to put them together because I knew Grantham was going to be one of the heroes of the later book. And um, I don't – and if there's anything mean-spirited about it, it wouldn't have worked. Like if, if readers really believed that Grantham wanted to marry Violet, that he was in yeah. love with Violet, right. that relationship never would have worked. People would have been frustrated with it. But – Grantham made it clear that he was <laughs> he was he was being kind to his friend, yeah. um, and thus um, he was relieved actually when Arthur said he would marry Violet. So I tried I tried to get that across um, because yeah because I just um, see in my own life you know I see men who are trying very hard to be supportive and but also masculine but also feminine but also in every once in a while they're just they're just they are goofy as hell and I love it and that's what I always want to capture I just want to make sure that um it comes across always um not just comedic but as well intentioned I I think it does and it was it was really nice to see it read them all like very um shortly like after each other um because, like, you get book three now in there. Um, and just seeing that progression of them. It was just so sweet. And, like, the the romance novel that's, like, constantly brought up. I yes. love that. That, uh, I mean, the end of book two is, like, one of my favorite. It, it, I think it may be my favorite, like, uh, grand gesture. Or, like, attempted grand gesture. <laughs> because you just see uh, Grey, Grey Cliff and Grantham, like, attempting <laughs> <laughs> to be those and then Grantham's like I don't want to do this Gray's like you need to do this you need to be the pirate oh my god I loved it so much I when that happened I was like literally screaming it was so fun <laughs> it was so fun I also just like you're one of the only authors that writes grand gestures that I actually mm-hmm. I'm really picky about grand gestures I mm-hmm. don't like public displays of affection mm-hmm. they 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 ick me out mostly mm-hmm. a contemporary but historical even and so i was like oh thank you you've managed to write grand gestures that i like eat up every time because they're not like they don't make me uncomfortable 
it's just like very earnest. And I love an earnest like like Grantham just confessing his fears. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's all she needed. She just needed you to open up. Also, he saved her life, but you know, <laughs> you know, he's like dragging her in. <laughs> he's like carrying her to try to save her. Life. Don't worry about that part, though. The part that I cared about was the <laughs> like confessing his fears, where I was like, "Oh, Grantham, I love him." I think too that part of that is there's um, someone said, "Oh, I, it was doing interviews for Perfect Equation," and someone brought up that old thing about romance novels. But don't they give women? false expectation <laughs> right we all know how we feel about that and um and i thought about that with the grand gesture and i thought about realistically you know some in relationships it's not just with men and it's not just you know straight relationships it's you know queer relationships as well um one partner's tempted to do something sort of big and over the top for the other partner to show them, okay, here's a show of my feelings, right? Because mm-hmm. sometimes we're not, we're not comfortable because sometimes we don't, we feel, we feel it's not enough to just say it, right? Because those words sometimes come too easily or too many people say them. Um, and those are, they can be small gestures, but they're grand anyways. And that's what I, kind of tried to do like uh uh it is a grand gesture for him to to i don't want to spoil the book to to do that to do the life-saving thing at the end it is grand in with in capital letters but his but he understood finally that he didn't necessarily need to say i love you what he needed to do was communicate it to her in a language that she would understand because we all um we all are tempted to do something maybe superficial and big when all we need to do in the most intimate, tender moments we have with our partners are, are when we're really listening and really like speaking their specific love language. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. it could be baking this huge cake, but but the fact that it's a cake that does not have any fruit in it or whatever it is, mm-hmm. is the small thing that cements it. And those moments, when I read those moments or when I see those moments yep. on film or when I see them between, you know, people I love – those that's to me that doesn't give anybody unrealistic expectations that's a very realistic expectation mm-hmm. know what your partner cares about know what their fears are know what their hopes are know what turns them on it doesn't have to be you don't have to dress up like a pirate but you could get you know but if you know that for example they have a favorite book then you get them that book in hardcover or something, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, so that's not unrealistic. That's very realistic. And I think that we all should have those expectations that we are in a, in a relationship, in a partnership, in a romantic relationship where the other person is listening. And it's just so romantic, like remembering those things. Cause like there's so much happening, like in all their lives and then they still remember those things. I mean, they're one of those, those are my favorite moments like are like those little things. I also think it's such a cop out argument for those people to say <laughs> false expectations. Like, I'm like, you're outing yourself as being kind of like <laughs> a, a terrible part. Either you <laughs> like, have yeah. really low expectations like, or yeah. you're not meeting expectations. Like, yeah. Oh, I, it very much is like that, like to be loved is to be known mm-hmm. idea. Like, I just want you to know this thing about me. And I feel like that is what hit for all of the grand gestures where I was like, you know what that person wants. Also, it was such a nice through line with Grantham's character from book one and the whole fight with Arthur, where, you know, he doesn't really want to marry Violet. He was mm-hmm. going to marry Phoebe to like help her out. He was going to marry Violet to help her out. And then finally, he's like, I'm going to marry you to help you out. And Margaret's like, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> That's you not need to get, let go of that hero complex, buddy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and it isn't until he's relieved of that that he's like, yeah, but this time I don't want to – this This is not just about me being selfless. This is – I actually want this. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see that when he's about to go complete this big grand gesture. He's like standing there. He's like – and everything starts to hit him. He's like, oh, I've been – I've been doing this wrong. This is this is how I need to do it. And ironically, letting go of the hero complex, he literally becomes a hero. <laughs> like, literally saves her life. 
I mean, my favorite, um, whether it be like a third act scene, like if it's not a breakup, um, mm-hmm. my is when someone gets like shot or injured or they're like bleeding out, and then that's like the whole catalyst for that, rather than them like breaking up for other reasons. <laughs> There's like a Lenora Bell book where they're <laughs> literally they were just having sex, and then he gets shot. Like the guy barges in, he's naked. They're all naked, and well, I guess suppose the shooter isn't. Um, but then he's just like bleeding out. And that was the whole scene. Um, I do love a good um, moment that's just extra like that. Somebody gets shot. Somebody gets stabbed. Also, someone is revealed as the villain yep. who you didn't know was the villain. And normally, I Book don't know out. because I normally am very bad <laughs> at reading clues. So, I mean, relatable. Like the ladies' formula for love. I really no. I was shook. No, the second, like the second and third time, especially this last time. Um, I, it was a lot easier for me to tell because like, obviously I had read the book, but the first time I was like, oh my God, this is scandalous. I didn't know. <laughs> well, scandalous. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I felt like Arthur when he was like, it was right in front of me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how did I not put the dots That together? is so nice to hear because I tried, um, like a long time ago, I tried writing like a um, a murder, like a cozy mystery. Mm-hmm. And from like the first chapter, everybody was like, well, that guy did it, right? From like the first chapter, I was like, God damn. Went back and I rewrote it. And they were like, yeah, that guy, he still did it, right? So um, so I was like, okay, take out the dead bodies and put in some sex. I will always take sex over or dead bodies. Okay, wait. There's no way to hang on. I will prefer sex to dead bodies. Is a better way to phrase that, I guess. Still feel like you're treading. You're it's, treading a little. It's not in. great, but it's it's better than saying sex over dead bodies, which has a different yeah. connotation. <laughs> I'm a little worried. I just pref- actually, I prefer the sex. Okay, I prefer I prefer the sex. I prefer the romance to the m- dead bodies. <laughs> so all sorts of scenarios are coming up now in my head, but I'm sure Don't. that's not what you meant. But Caroline, Please. she does love a ghost. So where does I do love ghosts, the line? <laughs> But I don't want their no body. No, I don't want a core. Listen, we need to move okay, on. But also Angelica Frankenstein. Just say, damn it, you're so right. Angelica Issue of necklace. You could just actually probably. It's fine. Edit. I, yeah. I kind of think you should leave it. Um, but, <laughs> but I would like to clarify that I'm not into necromancy. <laughs> I think anytime you have to clarify that you're not into necromancy <laughs> is just is just you know. A win for the chaos demons inside of us all. Um, but I was, um, I don't know if Elizabeth, have, if you've read uh, Angelica Frankenstein Makes Her Match by Sally Thorne. Um, no, but it's on my TBR. Literally, he was a corpse. So. He is a reanimated, sewn together corpse. So sometimes, sometimes maybe the corpse, you know? I just want to warn you that we're traveling back. All right. I, it's fine. Into we'll territory where. Somebody's going to pull a sound bite and cancel me. <laughs> bleep, bleep, bleep. Sex with corpses. Bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> yeah. Necrophilia is bad. So bad. If you're going to pull a sound bite, pull that one. Not relevant to the secret scientist funding no. at all. There's not no all. necrophilia. Not no. even close. No. Oh, yeah, why anyway. would you even? Let's not, you know, but yeah, do I have to say this? PSA, there are, there's no. There's no you, really it was the cozy mystery my books cozy mystery they're full of them yes but this is a romance it is so it is not full no. of them it's full of sex so sorry it's full that's, of the, sex. That's, the, that's the point we need to hammer home on yeah, yeah. oh god sex with alive people people mm-hmm. who are they're so alive and having sex they're so alive if they're having yeah. them in great interesting there's desks Oh God! Drafting desk. Book two. There's no beds. There's no bed. No, and because I do try and um, I don't believe in historical accuracy anymore. I recognize yeah. that that is not um, a thing, but I do try and keep one toe in reality and historical reality. I do do quite a bit of research um, in terms of like the the science and the setting, and um, you know, I, there's nothing really. Um, there's no glaring anachronisms, at least from 
at least I try very hard not to do that um, because – uh, I mean, it is a, it's a, it's a romance and I'm having fun, but I'm also, you know, um, I'm also doing the work and, um, with Letty and Gray, I mean, it hurt my brain to figure out how the two of them would be unchaperoned and together without creating another scandal. Because in mm-hmm. fact, it was very difficult for unmarried women to be alone with, unmarried men, no matter what the station was, unless one was a maid. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so I, you know, I tried to, obviously she probably wouldn't have been in real life in a lot of those positions, but I tried to make sure that the um, circumstances were somewhat at least believable. Ergo, you never see her like go back to his house and go up to his room and like, these are, and this is why um, I, I always tell myself I need to stop writing historical and write, start writing contemporary because it, it's so much faster. I could imagine. Like, I could imagine. you don't have to stop. At, I mean, for every three pages that I write, I have like, you know, there's there's like an hour or two that I spend going to my reference books or, you know, like in contemporaries, you just get into a car. <laughs> you have refrigerators <laughs> and you have showers. I'm on a pair of jeans. <laughs> Oh my God. It's not like you have to say, you know, whether it's a day dress or a gown and but if she has a, but like we know when they're having sex, you know, she just takes off her shirt. She doesn't have to unhook the busk and put, which is why I chose eight, the 1840s because um, other than the 1820s, easiest time period in which to get undressed. <laughs> That's really the reason you chose that time period? Yes. No. Oh my yes. Gosh. Partly. I said to myself, <laughs> no, I chose it because it was the beginning of Victoria's reign and there is a really interesting mm-hmm. socioeconomic um, divergence happening there um, from from what had come before. There is, there is, um, there's a reaction against all the excess of the 1820s. Um, and we become, you know, we talk about the Victorians being um, very moralistic and it's not that they are necessarily that moralistic. They were they were more they were kind of um, reacting against this excess that caused you know terrible economic and political problems in their country. Um, so I think that I thought if some if I'm right Victorian, I'm just not. I didn't wasn't interested in the 1880s, which is where most Victorian books are set because um, it. It was in, it was known to me, I suppose. Mm. Um, so I thought to myself, okay, start in the beginning. What's the beginning of this period like? Because the beginning of era, any era is like an examination of or a reaction to the era that came before it. But also, like in the 1830s, they had those big old sleeves they had to untie and that they would puff up. In the 1850s and 60s, we start getting into into cage skirts, and and I was just like, I can't. You know, I'm, I'm too literal. <laughs> yeah. To um, to to imagine these really great sex scenes when they're wearing, like a a hoop that's three times yeah. the their height lengthwise. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'm in support of it. I do like the reactionary politics. I was just having a really interesting discussion because as I was reading these books, and you have like the guardians of domesticity and everything. Um. At the same time, the publisher that I work for, we had a like World War II era historical fiction book come out, and the author had released an article about like the response to when men came back after the war to America, all of this like super misogynistic, like anti women advertising went out that was like basically telling women to go home and stop working yeah. and like you should be subjugate, and it was like very very similar rhetoric to the guardians of domesticity in these books and then also you have today all of (laughs) that which we don't need to get into but i was having like a really interesting discussion where i was like it's one of those like cross time periods it's all that same like reactionary and you get super like anti-women we don't want them working we want them in the home and it's it was just a really fascinating like i was connecting a lot of dots yeah, how, how misogyny is tied into um, like anytime there's economic insecurity, then mm-hmm. you need a scapegoat. So when times are good, 
we're like, yeah, do what you want. Go ahead, girl, be a CEO. And then when times are bad, it was like, where did all these women come from? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this job that a man needs to be doing? Right. Yeah. Why are you as an immigrant, why are you doing this job that or, yes. that an American should be doing, even though our education system is so bad, <laughs> there's only like four people that can actually do this job. So um yeah, and that's why I choose to do historical, really, despite the work, is because it's just a commentary on mm-hmm. stuff that happens today, but we do it in fancy dresses. <laughs> Which, why would you choose to not have fancy dresses when you could have fancy yeah, dresses? Right? And, like, Carolyn and we were talking about that a little bit before this, just about, like, people commenting about, like, anachronistic stuff. And you're just like, do you want, like, then go read historical fiction. <laughs> Like that. This is maybe not. <laughs> I always want to be like. Do you know what a duke actually would have been like? So <laughs> number one, he wasn't young, hot, yeah. and eligible. Yeah, he didn't look like Colin Firth. Like, and it would also be like the same last, like the same like titles, like the same five titles in like every book that are like eligible at that time. So I just wrote an article for Writer's Digest about historical anachronisms and historical romance. Mm. In which I say, I'm never going to, in any of my reviews from now on, use that term historical accuracy because it's, it, historical fiction is is fiction. Um, it's And history is fiction because it depends on who's writing it, mm-hmm. right? So you could read a first-person account of a civil war and you could think that um, – you could think that – Thing that Abraham Lincoln was an idiot. He didn't know what he's doing. You know, it depends on who, as soon as you set pen to paper, historians are writing from a point of view. And bias, too. You know. Absolutely. So, <sighs> uh, and so, yeah, so dinging, when the anachronisms are so obvious, right, like a young, hot Duke, dinging that writer for putting that anachronism in there is is pointless. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, slamming someone for, for the sake of being able to slam them, right? Because because I think as a readership, we've all agreed there are some things that we accept in historical romance. We accept that that they we all accept that they bathe, okay, even yes. though we all know <laughs> that they didn't. But mm-hmm. because as we have bigger fish to fry. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, I could try and figure out a way in these books to make them, the characters, you know, um, have skin problems so they have to, you know what I mean? I could figure out a way to do it historically accurately. But what, why? Now I'm spending time doing that and nobody's begging. Nobody's begging. Nobody's having a good time. So it's a pact you enter into. It's like in fantasy books. You don't say, well, you know, an elf. Really, if you're going to do Tolkien's yeah. elf, they're going to no. I mean, it's a fantasy book. That person's elf is that person's elf, and you enter into a pact when you read their book that you're going to take their description of the elf and go with it because that's their world. They're they're giving it to you, and I think it's the same with with you know dukes with teeth. Yeah. Okay. It's all stop. We all know that dukes. Probably didn't have their own teeth in their mouth. All Rakes, four of them. Syphilis. Okay? Syphilis everywhere. And ingesting like, mercury and like all this really bad stuff to get rid of it. Let's just, it's, 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 let's just, you know, accept that this is, we're just pretending. This is just pretend. So mm-hmm. everybody just calm down. And no, I have a, my friend Sajana at Baskin Sons, um, who is just brilliant, but she talks a lot about how like historical romance is closer to fantasy mm-hmm. as a genre than it is to historical fiction. And the first time I heard her say that, it was like a light bulb yep. went on where like I had been having these kind of like this is this other world, which already you get into like historical romance is really just fan fiction of Georgia Hayer's version, which is like very sterilized and white mm-hmm. and all of these things. So you already have all of that. But then also it's just like a shared world that is not actually history, but we know the conventions. We have all accepted the world building that has been done. So you don't have to world build because you already know what you're getting into. But it's not historical fiction. That's not what we're here for. I'm going to say even historical fiction, and I'm a huge fan of historical fiction, but you yeah. know, um, you walk into Barnes and Nobles and there's a table and on the table are two dozen books 
of women, girls, small children holding suitcases, flowers, books, looking into the distance of Paris, Spain, London, as their socks sort of come down around their 1940s. You know what I mean? You know. Like, yes. Okay. And there are, and, and in those books, we enter the pact that we're not going to read anything about World War II that isn't hegemony. That hasn't already been, you know what I mean? You're not going to find in there um, a, a realistic account. You're going to find something that's sanitized and you're because you're there to read a story. You know, even though it's historical fiction, it's a fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know sort of, and this is why, you know, people are like, well, why do all the covers look the same? And I'm like, well, that's kind of a shorthand to Mm -hmm. you, the reader, to tell you that this is what you're going to get. So if you're good, if you've got a woman in a window looking out, holding a briefcase or whatever it is, you know. (laughs) then you know that this is the story that you're going to get, that you're not going to be hurt. You're not going to be shocked. You might cry. It might touch you. It might be, you know, it's it's not going to be a comedy. You know that too, right? It's a shorthand to tell you that this is what you get. But it's lumped under historical fiction. Should it be a subgenre? I don't know. Like should, should historical romance and historical fiction about women in the 1940s should they be their own category maybe maybe we don't have enough categories then you get into a lot of marketing questions yeah and what's like a genre convention and they're all in the genre developed that way or if that's yeah marketing in marketing and sales they're in charge so i don't i I don't ask questions (laughs) i'm just like okay yeah. Well, and that's I get that argument all the time from like non romance readers where they're like, "Well, why did they put like a shirtless man on the cover?" I'm like, "Because there's no other genre. You know what you're getting when yeah. you pick up a book with a shirtless man on the cover." Yeah, I know exactly what that is. I read a book like a, a nonfiction book not long ago that said, um, "Like shirtless man covers actually sell more than like a lone woman on the cover mm-hmm. because you can have other genre like historical fiction or right. you know women's fit quote unquote women's fiction which I hate that genre term but that I hate it. I hate contemporary it. fiction that is about women um, like that can have a lone woman on the there are other genres where you could but there's no other genre where you could have a shirtless man right like looking so, unless it's like a health like fitness <laughs> with like the, I don't I've never seen that but and you're it's gonna be a know style there's, you're gonna know because there it's in a different section of the it's a Yes. So my only, my biggest, like, the biggest argument I have against my books being clenched is, A, my husband is going to be jealous because he wants to be on the cover. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> no, is that, um, there is no, um, there, there's no humor in them. There's no way to signal to someone that you're going to have a good time. There's and the other thing I don't like I don't like when they cut the head off and there's just a oh, body yeah. in a dress. Like the I find the dresses are, but it could but to, but to other people it's very that dress is a symbol of something. Yeah. For me, it is. It is. I. It's not a. It's not an appealing symbol. But I know that for a lot of people. It is an appealing symbol, and that's why we they put them there. Is it's a it's a it's a quick burst to someone that this is a historical romance. I just think that they're missing the boat um, when they put rom historical rom coms with clinch covers as opposed to illustrated. I mean, I think that illustrated covers are a great way to show to show that this. Even, but the problem is, then I get historical readers who are like, "Oh, I didn't know your book was historical romance because it it was illustrated." I mean, they're like, it, they definitely have like the historical yep. silhouette. That was that felt pretty clear. All right, well, <laughs> no shade to anybody who didn't realize that those books are historical. But I mean, I get, come on, no, now. I get I get that all the time. I, this is really? I get huh. it all the time. There is a lot of um, sex in this book about women and science. Well, it's a. It's a romance, so that'll. In their defense, I had never read like my first historical romance was E.B. Dunmore's *Bringing Down the Duke*, yep. and I just like hadn't read a lot of romance. Period. Yep. Not even just historical romance. I'd read like maybe one or two, so I just didn't really know what I. I just saw somebody recommend this book and was like, "Okay, cool, well, historical. That sounds fun. There's a romance, whatever." And I was 
shocked in a good way. Yeah. I was delighted. Um, I've talked about this on the podcast yep. before, but I was like blasting the audiobook. I lived alone in a studio <laughs> apartment and I was blasting the audiobook. And it was one of those, like, it wasn't a sex scene, but Sebastian the hero said something about his cock hardening. And I was like, whoa. I like had to rewind because I was like, what did he just say? His his what? His yeah. Cock? I was like, huh? Um, I, it was a delightful realization. But I mean, and that illustrated cover. But that's really funny because I also started delightful. started with bringing down the Duke, and then I immediately went to Mr. Malcolm's list. So in my mind, I thought that now every like car- like cartoon cover is going to have sex, and it's going to like have these certain things, especially because I had like I said like I read Well Met, which also it was like more vague, I suppose, but like it also had sex. Um, but in like the historical context. I picked up Mr. Malcolm's list and then I was like, I, I, I ended it. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what happened? <Where's> sex? <laughs> and that was like my second one. <laughs> and I was so confused. And then, so it was really hard to be new to the genre and to have no idea what you were doing and where to go. And so it was really easy to then find other, then at that moment I knew I couldn't just fully trust the cover on expectations because I had no clue. Um, but like I read, um, Minerva Spencer, she had her illustrated cover series, Joanna Lowell, your series. That's why I picked yours up. Um, well, Minerva Spencer, but Minerva's first cover, her first covers with Kensington. They're, were, they're a clinch. Yep. Were a clinch and she loves, she loves them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think she's fine with the, I haven't talked to her in a while, but I think she's fine with the um, illustrated covers, but she really loves yeah, like a really artistic like full-on hardcore clinch cover i think she's got a really good eye patch cover i think i have a few well, of but, books yeah the second one the second yeah. one in the series yeah yeah to your point about like the clinch not always conveying the humor i didn't read i mean i started in illustrated and i was one of those people who like i didn't understand anything about historical romance so i was like oh i don't read bodice rippers thinking that bodice ripper equated to clinch cover and those were somehow more trashy right, yeah. whatever okay. i very yeah. quickly realized the error of my ways but initially that was my like i didn't want to read anything with the shirtless people and so it took a while before i read my first tessa dare mm. and was like oh this is a rom com like i was shocked yeah. because the cover was a clinch which is why like i there's some pushback about like her I don't know if it was like recovering some of her old ones with Illustrated well, or if the next one is going to be Illustrated, but whatever it is, some people don't like that. Yeah. They... And I was like, that kind of fits the vibe more to me of a Tessa Dare book. It, it makes sense to me that that would be Illustrated because I was really surprised when I read like When a Scott Ties the Knot and mm-hmm. was like, oh, this is very funny. This is a rom-com. They rejected some of like her first few series in the headless style that matches Bridgerton. I mean – the oh, whole yeah. what i saw one that was but, but then yeah. they, they re- bridgerton, the, the reintroduction that avon did of bridgerton Ugh. their covers has had a huge Such an impact. impact and that is sexless like the sexless covers mm-hmm. and obviously they sold bridgerton at the beginning full of sex and then you saw what happened to the season two and then you also see what happened to the covers and how they got rid of any sex appeal i mean even the original bridgerton covers i mean you had setbacks but like the original covers were still very um discreet but like just seeing what that had like how that impacted all these books and all these random series it was quite hard to process um but in terms of tessa dare i think they like uh a night to surrender i think they rejacketed in um cartoon because then that was like a but i think that's only the ebook i don't know if you can get that the physical one um but yeah the bridgerton um one is, is just so intriguing and i'm like why take their heads out like why why are we doing that <laughs> like like they they can be fully clothed, but they can still have a head. And then forever took took it in, ran with it, and so now people are mid series. The the size of the book is completely different, and the cover of the book is completely different. And um, I don't know. I love forever, so I was I, I've just felt like um, I almost didn't know if it was a forever. I thought it was an, a, yeah. a Harper Collins, and then I realized it was a forever. When, yeah. But I do. I have to say, I do like um. I do like Emily's newest cover, Emily Sullivan's newest cover. Mm-hmm. The Hellion and the Hero. Mm-hmm. I don't mind That's it. A standard disclaimer that I always mention is that I am an intern in marketing and publicity for forever, just in case oh. anybody listening doesn't know that. No, I but didn't did you know, know that. that. I did oh, not okay. know that. 
That's so funny. I'm a marketing and publicity intern for forever. Um, all opinions are my own and our own. That's I just want to say um, I yeah, say it every no, time forever. Yeah. Comes up. Nope, because I feel um, like um but I know exactly what you're talking about because when mm-hmm. I joined, it was after the Bridgerton thing mm-hmm. and there was a bunch of like we were going back from Mass Market. Max was a thing for a while, back yeah. to Mass Market. Right. And now things are getting pushed into trade right. illustrated covers yeah. right. with the Winchesters, which is interesting to me because the Winchesters is a, another series like Tessa Dare, mm-hmm. the Erica Ridley series that like makes sense as an illustrated okay. cover. But we're switching on the fourth <laughs> book of the series. The first three are already out. The first two were Mass Market Max. The third one was Mass Market. All of those were Clinch. And now the fourth is a trade paper illustrated. And I think the trade paper illustrated makes sense for this particular series. Mm -hmm. It is gorgeous. I love that cover, but it's just like, Mm -hmm. ah, we're following all these trends and like different. And I mean, I don't have any control over any covers ever. Um, No, well, neither do. I mean, nobody does except for sales in the end. Mm -hmm. Sales is in charge. That's, it's all of that. So it's very complicated how those decisions get made, but it's really interesting seeing like how Bridgerton shifted and how the different like marketing trends are pushing towards trade paper. How they're pushing towards illustrate like which books are getting pushed into that mm-hmm. it's very complicated well then i saw somewhere that walmart was really pushing for the headless like bridgerton style and then they weren't yes. selling and then yes. now they're like stop that and i'm yeah. just like i didn't know walmart had that big of a say Dude. because i rarely mm-hmm. now with the pandemic i don't really go into stores and so mm-hmm. like i have it, i only really go into barnes and noble i guess because you know i can kind of distance um but like i haven't bought a book at walmart and I don't know whatever. I don't know if I ever have, except for when I was in like up north and that was the only store um, a- available to buy like a book at. So I always found that interesting that Walmart. Oh, like I have. Such- Target's big too. But yeah. I think Walmart, I mean, Walmart's influence on mass, mass market paperbacks is huge. Mm-hmm. Target's influence on like what constitutes a bestseller or, or something mm-hmm. is, it, is, is strong as well, but I think that that particular but Walmart in particular with mass market paperbacks, they yes. they would be like you you know I know um, when um, I'm gonna not gonna mention which author it is because like I can't remember which pen name she wrote under when she mm. did this series, I'm like, and I'll use two of them and they will both be wrong. But um, <laughs> when she was writing the series, she was told how many fucks she could give. Like literally, like how many, like there's two yeah. fucks in this for Walmart. You're going to have to take some fucks out. And you couldn't, certain words you couldn't use. And um, I don't I don't know if anal sex was out completely or not, but she was definitely given a, a, a cap. Mm-hmm. On from the, Walmart? From, to, in order for it to be stocked. I'm sure Walmart didn't send PRH a, yeah. a letter saying seven. Right. You get seven fucks and then you're done. <laughs> But um, I do know that she was told to to cut them back. Yeah, you don't you have to cut them all out. But you have to cut them back in order for um, Walmart to be comfortable right. stocking. That's intriguing. My um, we used to go to a bunch of like author talks and stuff. Um, and I'm in Minnesota, and there's like an Excelsior Bay is like a big area for authors to come to. They have a good marketing uh, presence. And Amy E. Riker came one time um and my mom likes to get authors to sign books and then put their favorite word and she signed it my favorite word is fuck because they told me i couldn't put fuck in my book (laughs) so she's like i'm gonna like sign it like this and i was like that's i love you love that um i too love that word um and so she that was also i suppose uh for whatever genre she's more in like the contemporary just fiction um where they're probably also regulated on the amount of fucks you can give so were you ever publishing – were they picky about, like, take out this many sex scenes or, like, any – like, limiting your writing? No, my publisher and my editor have ne- never. They've – um You know, I know that back in the day um, – there was pushback, I think, more at HarperCollins than there was at PRH about, like, queer characters and, um, you know – but, I mean – it's, it's so, so much, thank goodness, so much has changed and there's so much new um, historical support for, mm-hmm. you know, writing kind people who accept, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> and who are accepting. So like, like, oh, you know, a hundred years ago, everybody was a jerk. Sorry. No, nope, no, nope, you can't have a queer person in your book because everybody would have burned them alive. Really? I'm sure. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but um 
I, I asked my editor about that. I was like, should I add a scene? Should I not add a scene? And, and, and she's amazing. She's like, what, where, where, how do you feel? Do you, do you know, is that where they're going or, um, but not, that's not to say that if I came up with something, um, pushing the envelope that we wouldn't have a discussion. And this is where, so we were going to talk yeah, about yeah, kids. Yeah. Yes. Just by the way, Carolyn, I don't know if you know we were going to talk about that. But <laughs> oh, I knew. She was seeing all of, so we were DMing on the podcast um, Instagram. And so every message that you sent, she was also receiving, okay. but she was a fascinating conversation <laughs> and, to get only half of because <laughs> she could like see my responses like after I sent them. But like she was like getting all your random messages and she was like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. It was good. Um, but um, yeah. So, so there's when there's language, there's there's been certain incidences of language in my books where you've had like long back and forths. And my editor also edits Cozy Mysteries. So she always laughs about, like, if the FBI ever, like, looked in her search bar, like, what they would find because it's basically poison and penises. That's, um, that's this episode. We've talked. Okay. We've hit both. <laughs> Stop. We don't need to go back to that. Okay. <laughs> Stay away from the dead bodies. Um, like, we decided – the first book we started capitalizing black mm-hmm. when as a description as a BIPOC person, um, whereas before it, it hadn't been capitalized. The people who are used to, you know, who, who have certain um, expectations when it comes to historical fiction, were yeah. like, they didn't capitalize black back yep. in the 18th. So there's, um, and it's the same with, uh, okay, wait, I got to wait until the teenagers go downstairs. There's like a, group of my youngest daughter and her friends. I just, I don't want to have that click conversation. I could, <laughs> I could but then she rolls her eyes and she's like, God, <sighs> um, so, so clip came up in the first book <clears throat> and my, and it came up not with her, the, it came up in copy edits. And of course, the you know, the copy editor who I really, really liked for my first book um, pointed out that that it really, that came into um, common usage in the 1950s. And I said, I know that, but I haven't found um, an historically accurate term for the clitoris that would be, that wouldn't be jarring even more jarring yeah do you know what i mean in a scene yeah. like you know so we have our we have our standard euphemisms in historical romance i have found which i borrow from greatly and i'm not slamming them at all because i've used them pearl it's a treasure <laughs> it's <laughs> you know you gotta unearth that we got excavate yeah okay um center mm-hmm. um Tangle of need. I don't know. We, there's lots of you. Bundle, bundle of nerves. Bundle. Right. So I don't do that. I can't do that because um, the nervous system was not, it wasn't, the nervous system wasn't completely understood at that time because I considered oh, it and I was like, no, she didn't know it was a bundle of nerves. She just huh. knows she's happy. So, <laughs> um, so, so she, so I emailed her about what the copy editor said and I was like, I, I just don't have another word for it. And she was like, okay, well, you know, it, like it was maybe about three or four emails and she was like, okay, we're going with clit. And then I was like, you have the best job ever, don't you? <laughs> Cause then I noticed it, I think in book two as well. I think there was like one scene at the end, the wall yeah. scene, I think, yeah. which was a great scene. Um, I noticed that the other day in the audiobook. So um, and the reason that <laughs> Hannah and I were having that discussion is because uh, someone in a review, and I'm not going to say who or in which publication, mm-hmm. found it jarring. And I <clears throat> and uh, and it was just one of many things I didn't like about it. And I. And um and I and and I wanted to say what tell me go find me something other than bean because I'm not gonna use that. Go but, find me 
my happy button. I, I was reading one that I won't say what, but I was talking to Hannah about it earlier because it was a decent novella, but the sex scenes were not good. Um, and there was a mention of she brought his sword to her sheath, and I was like, wow, that's a choice. But specifically, she used pearl and button back to back. A pearl I was button. Not pleased. The hard thing uh-huh. button is like you're like you're. What are you buttoning? What? What? Well, I was like like a toy, like, like a button. <laughs> That's exactly, and if you're pressing it, then that's not a great sex scene. I'll tell you just that right now. No, I just just poking at it like what, what you do. Just, like if anything, that is far more jarring. Jar, yeah, I mean <laughs> nub. A, a nub will take me out. Nub is, I don't yes. mind nub, but I understand why you don't like it. I I really I don't think I have used it. I mean, there's times when you're just like. Ah, by the third page, you're like, oh my God, the blossoming lotus of the world. <laughs> you know, you're kind of like, yeah. you're just trying to find another word. You're trying to find another word. You're trying the to petals. stay in the moment. You're trying to pass. Um, and it doesn't, it just, and you're like, never mind. Let's just move on to the tits. You know what I mean? Like, what are you <laughs> yeah. Gonna, there's only so much you could do at this point. So I said to Hannah, I am sending this out there. To the podcast diverse, mm-hmm. books diverse, whatever, that um, I will send any lucky person a signed copy of A Love by Design and some um, and little self care trinkets if they will send to me <laughs> elizabetheverettauthor.com. That's my website. You can just send me an email from there. Um, a historically accurate and yet not gross <laughs> just word for clit send it to me if you know it then send it to me don't ding me for using clit and not give me something else you know what it's it was i was ex- I, this is the first it was the first um bad trade review i've ever had so it was kind of like a badge of honor but the whole thing about the clit like i just was like that's not fair because I've been looking for yeah. that word, another word for a long time. Um, and I just haven't found anything that's aesthetically pleasing. No, I, so like, I have no idea. If you're going to really get on historical accuracy, the word clit is the thing. That's the hill you're going to yeah. die on. Yeah. And we know uh, from earlier yeah. how we feel about historical accuracy. But right. like, j- the word clit? <laughs> that? That's what stuck out as like this yeah. is the thing that took me out of the story. You know, what? like again, the thing about historical accuracy in reading historical romance and making that pact, right? That unwritten pact yeah. you make with the author when you go in, and that is that um, there you're <laughs> you're going to accept some some terms. You're going to know that, like, yes, they're going to call they're going to you know call his cock. They're going to call his penis cock because that's historically, that's kind of like what historical romance likes. They're not going to call it, you know, anything contemporary. You know that they're going to, call, you know, you know, you know that we're going to use certain words in certain places because that's, because we're working within our limitations, right? We have a scaffold. Here's a scaffold. It's historical romance. I'm working within it. Yeah, I'm subverting it. But if I subvert it too much, then it's not we're not, we didn't, then I'm um, reneging on our understanding when you went into the book, mm-hmm. right? If the outline isn't there and isn't true to historical romance, then you're going to be frustrated. So it's fine if I flip the details. It's fine if I have a virgin hero as opposed to a virgin heroine, because we all understand going in that the, my dog is snoring. She's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it oh, I can't hear it. It I, honestly I sounded it. like she was like, "Uh huh." <laughs> she agrees. She does. She said, "You're right." She's like, "Hell yeah, ma." No notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other stuff like you know, other stuff is not going to work. So that's that's my spiel on clits. There you go. All done. Yeah, I mean, I do think there are things that, like, if if you go too far, it'll take me out of the story. Like, I think if I ever saw dick, I'd be like, huh? Right. Because that's, because, like, a very yeah. contemporary term. And there are a lot of other terms. Clit would not take me out, though. There are a lot of other terms that are historically, if right. not accurate, at least they, they meld. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Right. I will I will say though that Eloisa James uses tool and I want Which I think is actually more accurate than cock. But that is jarring to me. I'm mm-hmm. like what are we fixing? <laughs> what are we I so you have to find the balance of like this is sexy yeah. but it also It's, it's the mental imagery the too because if automatically mm-hmm. you think of a big wrench you're like oh. Mm-hmm. But then she had she had one book um that she i don't know she, he, i think he was like big fat cock and i was listening it was like 3 a.m and i was listening at like <laughs> two plus speed and this is eloisa james it was like an older series so i had listened to like seven or eight books already and then i get like i'm like laying in bed like half asleep and then he's just like my big fat cock and i was like what the fuck <laughs> it's like what is going on <laughs> i was like <sighs> I was like, okay, I'm cool with it, but I was like, this is not the tool that I'm used to. (laughs) It was a great time, and that's why I love this genre, (laughs) because that was That's why. Just that. That that is the only reason. Uh, (laughs) um, But that's my favorite example, because I was- You gotta know when to break the rules. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta know when to hold them. You gotta know when to fold them. I was having a, like, when Bridgerton was big and I was fighting with my parents, because they are not historical romance, they're not romance readers, mm. and they love to harp on historical accuracy. That's mm. their favorite thing, and it kills me. And so I have tried to explain the whole, like, all of this. That it's closer to fantasy. You're, it's a, this different word. We're not really going for act, whatever. Because I was trying to explain Bridgerton, where they were like, well, I don't know, that doesn't sound historically at blah, blah, blah. Why even put it in that setting if you're going to break the rules? And I was trying to explain, like, you have to keep these rules so that you can choose which rules you right. want to break right. yes. with intention. Yeah. You're you're breaking them on part. The author is never just like, I mean, unless it's not like great writing. Like, sometimes I'll be reading where it's like, oh, you didn't do a lot of research. They're using Christian right. names. They're right. alone together right. with Noah, right. like like a lot of it with no like, oh, I can kind of see for narrative purpose why you would need to do that. But mo- if it's a good writer, they're breaking the rule with intention. It's like poetry, you know? Like- so you have to follow the rest mm-hmm. of the rules so that you can break some rules. Right, right. Otherwise, it's not recognizable. Mm-hmm. Right. It's fine. Every time I see a review that complains about historical accuracy, I just have to <laughs> fight the urge to like, because I'm not going to comment on somebody's no. review. No, we don't do and, that. Like, fight them about it. I, that's not that's not my gospel, but like, <laughs> I think about it. Well, because people will comment on my Goodreads reviews with like completely opposite opinions. I'm like, I love that for you, but I gave this book one star, and I don't think you saying that this is the best book you've ever read is going to change my mind. But also, if I read a five-star book, you saying that this is your, like, least favorite thing in the world is also, like, I just don't know the audacity. And, like, I'm so non... Like, I don't want to confront people. And so, like, I just would never... Like, I see opinions that I don't agree with, but I'm like, I don't... In what world would I be like, yeah, I actually loved this book and you hated it and I want to talk about it with you. Like, obviously, we, like, have a podcast. Like, we disagree sometimes, but, like... Not with a random stranger on the internet. You don't know what can happen. Like, <laughs> you don't know who I am. <laughs> I don't think people come to the internet um, to have dialogue yeah, when they have something true. something negative to say. I don't think they're there to engage. No, I think they're not there constructively. To, <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so I don't, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the thing about historical accuracy um, I, in historical anachronisms, I gave that subject to my PR person before the book came out. And I said, if anybody wants me to write and, you know, like, so, so they reach out to different, you know, um, magazines or, or websites or whatever. And they say, you know, do you want to hear from this author? And I give her a list of things that I'm interested in talking about. So some, maybe sometimes I'll see something negative and I'll think, oh, I can, you know, obviously I'm not going to tell this guy that, you yeah. know. He's an idiot, but the, the point that makes me mad is the point that I'm exactly. going to make. I'm going to make that larger point. I'm going to make it and put it in context. And um, I'm more than happy to, if someone takes, you know, wants to do a panel on it or something like that, I'm more than happy to do that because that's engaging. Right. Exactly. And that's, and it is constructive in a way, like you're, you're trying to get somewhere. It does make me think of all of the – like, I read all of the author's notes yes. Um, yes. with historical romance, usually just because there's fascinating – like, Courtney Milan's author's notes, mm-hmm. 
I mean, most author's notes ever. They're always interesting. But hers are like essays. I'm always like, all right, what am I going to learn today that I had no idea about? Um, but it's all – I'm every time I'm like, ah, oh, and here's the preemptive. Like, so they know that someone's going to complain about this. Yep. So let me say, here's all the research. Like, here are the choices that I made for this reason. Or like, um, I had been having discussion not long ago about Adriana Herrera's A Caribbean Heiress in Paris. Got oh, my God, so good. People. It's phenomenal. Oh, it was what? a five-star read for me. Um, people were complaining, and I didn't know this this at all, but apparently some people were annoyed because it felt like in the book she was, like, info dumping to try to justify, uh, like, the like exi- the, the, the fact that there were brown people in Europe, basically. Right. Like, that they were there for a reason, and they she- felt like she did too much explaining, which uh, I didn't think was true at all. I, th- I thought that it was so seamless. I actually think she did a great job at that. Mm-hmm. It seemed with, like, Beverly Jenkins – Mm-hmm. Yes. I think that's one of her really strong points and it's why I always recommend her um, novels to people who, who don't read romance to have an introduction to historical romance is because she gives you context. There's context there. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you're you're like, oh, okay, here I am. And yes, this is the small story that I'm – I love these characters, but I'm also setting it in the context of the larger story and I already have some idea about this, but it's new to me. So mm-hmm. you're reading it on two levels. Um, and I think I just think she does that really well. Lisa Kleppis will do yeah. this too mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. when she's writing about her time period, which is like the 18, the, the late 1800s, the late Victorian age, when, again, you have, because you're ending one era going into another, you have this flux, this change, this societal change. Um, so she's very good about putting her heroes and heroines in context Ladies don't do this. However, mm-hmm. with the you know with the rise of the railroads and with the rise of the merchant class, things are changing. And then she's so you have this love story, but it's set in the context of a larger story. Right. Um, so I also recommend her to people who have not ever read historical romance and want to start. I think she's a great place to start because. Um, you're 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 in familiar territory in a way with um, if you read historical fiction. Mm-hmm. You know, because you're 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 like, oh, okay, here I am. She's setting the the context for me, and then you're like, whoa, <laughs> and, and I like it. So <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what especially with like the BIPOC historical authors. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, of course, they're like preemptively cutting off anybody who's like, yeah, right. well, there wouldn't have been Dominican people yeah. in France. And she's like, yeah, yeah there were. Here's yeah. all the context. Yeah. Here's all the proof. Yeah. So I like was not at all frustrated. I thought it was fascinating. No, all she, that it's history. a burden for her though. It's an extra burden. Mm-hmm. It's not, yeah. like, you know, for – Totally for, unfair to put that completely, on her. Completely unfair. And it's um, she did a remarkable job with it. So that's another mm-hmm. reason why I think um, – she should be lauded for that series. Yes. Um, I'm really excited about the second one. And the cover. The cover. I love pink. I'm oh. so excited. Yeah, I'm really excited. It was gorgeous. Anyway. I mean, I think these were also very well set in, like, with the context. Especially, I I just thought the like, I really am back on the Guardians of Domesticity. Yeah. Like, I think that that is such a fascinating, like, really pushing back against women outside of the home. Mm-hmm. There wasn't, you know, there there wasn't an organized group like that. Um, mm-hmm. But I I needed to create one in order to have that discussion, um, and I just felt like this was. So, so I wrote the book too in two thousand eighteen. Like I wrote the book pre pandemic. I wrote the book mm-hmm. <laughs> right at the beginning of the Trump administration. Right, it was more about science. It was more about this pushback against science. And I thought, why are scientists coming under what? They're just out there trying to do their nerdy best. God damn mm-hmm. it. Give them some, you know. <laughs> um, and so in the second book, I kind of I I created that so that we would have, we could um kind of crystallize, kind of have in our heads, like, okay, this is this represent this is a representation of something, and then you could put in whatever representation of it you wanted. Um and who knows, like maybe another hundred years, people will read it and be like, oh, that's like this group. You know, I don't I think that it's one of those cyclic things. And again, like the, how the economy is tied to misogyny and tied to racism and tried to um, to um, 
to a lot of negative um, stereotypes because of insecurity and fear, Mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, throughout history, that's what we do. You turn inward Mm -hmm. and blame the other. No, that makes sense. I mean, I totally, like, you need, you can't just fight, like, generally a societal idea. So you need a group or, a mm-hmm. per, like, a person, like yeah. Armitage, to directly, he represents this belief. Yeah. And so you can fight that individual yeah. in the context of a story. And they always keep That's popping back up, so you don't have to, you know. Keep coming up with somebody new. Keep coming up with somebody new, because <laughs> you can't, it's like whack-a-mole. Oh, my God. <laughs> Now there's incels. Now there's a ah, – jeez Louise. I also just love how historical romance currently is, like, slandering the name um, Armitage. Like, if you read the Wisteria Society, um, I Lady Armitage. <laughs> must be, I didn't like, realize a that. When I made it up, I was like, what's a good mm-hmm. sound in Victorian name? Yeah, and it then, is. It's funny. Well, thank you so much. Yes, ladies. for talking us. This was awesome. This I was a lot of fun. You're always welcome <laughs> yes. back anytime. And I'm serious about that. So, so okay. So the details of the giveaway. So, which so should people email me with the name? Um, I mean, I think the email sounded yeah. fine. Okay, because that way, can, I mean, it can go directly to you. But I think that all made sense. And we can okay. put your email in the in the show notes, and then it'll okay. put them right there. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right, because. I am interested to see what happens if anybody. I hope can. somebody. I let us know what you receive yeah. because if this could, you know, change, <laughs> change a little bit, I'd be very excited. Um, yeah, I mean, somebody is like, oh, of course, this obscure. Uh, I don't yeah, learn, like, like, term. So intrigued that the bundle of nerves. Like I've never heard that. Like that. That's not even accurate either. So like that. I'd rather yeah. quit then. <laughs> like if we're going one than the other, like. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. Well, she, I was just like, historically, they're not going to know that those are nerve endings. They're not yeah. going to know that mm-hmm. nerves are there because they don't understand the nervous system. I mean, the people, there are people who do, but they're basically like anonymous, you know, like mm-hmm. that's not general knowledge to like right. little young virgins in like <laughs> Suffolk who are doing the Duke for the first time. They're not going to be like, whoa, this is a, the electrical lights in my brain or, you know, you know the, the synapses in my yeah. brain are firing. What are you talking about, the synapses? <laughs> you know how you think when you're having sex? You know how you think? If that's your thought process, you might be doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's not usually a phrase. It comes in your head when you're having sex. The synapses in my brain are firing. My fiery bundle of nerves. Unless you're like one of those blue stocking heroines yep, who like another like interest. a scientific if it's her niche interest and she right. does that. It, it could yep. be. It yep. could be. And she's like, whoa, look at this. My theories are true. Ding, ding. So when you write the first female neuroscientist, right. please. There we I go. I will. I will. I've written the sex scene for you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Our exactly. work is done. <laughs> work here is done. <laughs> Oh, God. Let's go take some notes on that. All right, ladies. Oh. <laughs> and on that note. This was fabulous. This was lovely. Um, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh. Bye-bye. Bye.